This is The Impact. Hello, this is Mike McClanahan with TVW, and you are watching our special 2019 Signy Die end of the regular legislative session special. At this point, the lawmakers in both the House and Senate have had very late nights and are still working out some critical details related to the budgets. Joining us now, House Republican Leader Representative J.T. Wilcox, thank you very much for coming up and uh, staying awake with us here. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Well, so I'll get right to it. At this point, looking at what we know or what you know about the budget, what do you think are likely to be the biggest sticking points? Well, I'm the House Republican leader, so you could imagine that taxes are a big issue for us. And we've been saying since day one that uh, there's plenty of new revenue. Uh, we had uh, something like 16 or 17 percent growth in uh, revenue just based on uh, the economy and current law and generous taxpayers. I think that uh, either of the two Republican budget writers could have easily used existing revenues to write a great budget. And I, I think I feel uh, a sense of disappointment that the taxpayers of Washington, at a time uh, you know when they should be enjoying the fruits of their labor, are having to pay additional taxes. And we all know that whether the uh, uh, immediate taxpayer is uh, an individual or a business, it's really just working people in Washington that end up paying the taxes. And that, uh, I think, is a tragedy this year. So, well, and, uh, to devil's advocate here, the House Democratic budget leaders would say that there's, that there's really not an excess or, or surplus because of the McCleary obligations and other existing obligations, that there's, there's really no excess revenue. Yeah, well, you've been around here for a few years now, and I, I don't think anybody that's been here for, for more than two or three years could doubt that the inventive uh, budget writers uh, like John Braun and uh, now our new lead, Drew Stokesbury, have proven over and over that they can write budgets that uh, live within existing revenues. And by the way, John Braun, the Senate uh, Republican budget writer, wrote budgets when he had far less new revenue uh, to work with. Uh, just along with the budget, some of the other big uh some, I would say, more progressive bills that, uh, than we've seen in recent years have, have cleared both chambers. What's your perspective on, for example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tax bill related to – oh, sorry, I got uh, – lost my train of thought here the, – um, the public option bill. There you go. Couldn't get the word out. What do you, what's your perspective on that? Well, first of all, I think uh, all of us understand the, the public's frustration with what's happening with the cost of health care and because of that the cost of insurance. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of us in the House Republican caucus uh, either work in the private economy uh, or uh, are business owners and understand that it has become more and more difficult for any of us to find uh, private uh, health care insurance options. So we, we know what's going on in the background here, but so much of the growth that we're seeing in the cost of health care has been because of all of the government t tinkering with uh, the system. Uh, additional mandates uh, both on uh, patients and also on uh, medical professionals and uh, the agencies and companies that are involved in health care. And so although we want to find ways to make health care less expensive and more affordable for uh, all of our citizens here, we're not sure that uh, adding another uh, government-run option is the way to do that. In fact, we, we think that uh, more uh, private competition is a much better answer. And in, in looking at some of the higher education and workforce training related proposals, uh, there was a good bit of a dust up uh, related to the B&O tax proposal and, and how that would work in conjunction with funding, worker training and that sort of stuff. Uh, do, you, do you think that that's uh, a fair proposal? Not at all. Uh, you've seen us uh, talk again and again about how uh, budgeting is all about uh, acting on your priorities. And when you take an item and say we're only going to fund it if we have new taxes, that tells me that it is not your first priority, it's your last priority. And I'll go back to when John Braun was writing budgets. Uh, they were able to either uh, hold tuition costs steady or reduce the cost of tuition because they made uh, higher ed and its availability to uh, everyday taxpayers and citizens 
a, a much higher priority than it has been now. And, you know, we've heard so much talk about progressive revenue. There is nothing the least bit progressive about B&O taxes. B&O tax increases often fall the heaviest on uh, the smallest kinds of business, the, the you know, one, one person uh, types of small businesses. And it, it is such a uh, regressive form of uh, asking uh, the business community to uh, pay for the functions of government because it is a much higher rate, of course, on businesses that are less profitable. So we've got a ton of problems with that one, and I think it's a tragedy for our state that that is going to be one of the largest tax increases in this package. Washington State is poised to be the first state in the country with a long-term care uh, trust plan uh, for workers to pay into. Um, that the terms of the, the deal, so to speak, uh, would theoretically apply to uh, any worker who fits certain categories, but my understanding is everyone would pay into it through payroll taxes. What's your perspective on the, you know, the long-term care trust legislation? Yeah. With an aging, aging uh, you know, population and, and skyrocketing medical bills, does it make sense? Well, you mentioned skyrocketing medical bills. Uh, it's, it's very limited, so uh, it's not going to help with people that have uh, very high uh, cost medical issues. And uh, I will say that that uh, is an idea that has had some support from both sides. Uh, in the end, I think uh, most Republicans uh, felt like uh, this is one new uh, payroll tax type mandate uh, on top of uh, one that was passed last year. And we heard, uh, I think, a pretty strong voice from uh, wage earners and also businesses that um, we have been doing enough when it comes to increasing uh, the, the cost to everyday taxpayers uh, that is taken away from them at uh, you know, the time of cutting a paycheck. And so we mostly didn't support that. But it's also addressing a frustration that people have. We've got a system that is way too expensive and often means that people have to spend down all of their resources, uh, sometimes uh, just at the end of their lives. And that's a problem with cost, too. And so it's very frustrating that we're working on how can we make people more, uh, excuse me, how can we make people pay more rather than how can we figure out how to make the service cost less? So uh, as the uh, you know, House Minority Party, what are some of the bigger policy wins so far this session? Well, you know, uh, in a week when uh, we have been uh, getting about three hours of sleep, uh, every night for two or three days in a row, it's a little hard to look at uh, all of the bright sides. But when you're in the minority, you have to understand you are not going to get a lot of things that you want. Uh, but your job really is to do everything that you can to pick the spots where you disagree with the majority party and you can prevent those things from uh, happening. And I think uh, one success that I would point to is because we've had, a, I think, a pretty successful debate in many cases on the floor and in committees with the majority party, uh, the taxes that have been passed are far less than the taxes that have been proposed. So I feel good about that. Uh, a lot of uh, people in, inside our state and, and people that are important in the economy uh, felt like the fact that we're not having an income tax imposed this year on top of all the other taxes was a pretty big win, but I know that we're going to be fighting that next year as well. And then I would talk about the things that uh, all of us agreed on. Uh, we've made some pretty major strides both in policy and in funding when it comes to mental health that's uh, very bipartisan, and uh, I think that uh, we've made some bipartisan progress, nowhere near as much as we wanted to in the areas of uh, housing and homelessness. And, you know, when you have uh, major uh, Democratic majorities, it's easy to add new funding. It's really hard to have wins when it comes to the kinds of policies that make it easier and less expensive to build, especially outside of you know, just the handful of large urban cores that we have. And so I'm happy that we've made a tiny bit of progress when it comes to how do we add housing, but really discouraged uh, by the fact that we've made so little progress in how do we make it less expensive uh, to build outside of those urban cores. One piece of legislation that uh, has, was divisive within your caucus, I understand, uh, the vaccine bill. 
give me your perspective on the re removing one of the the well the personal or philosophical exemption for um, the uh, measles mumps rubella vaccine. Yeah, well, you know, I, I would maybe quarrel a little bit with characterizing it as divisive. We've got a caucus that uh, is very cohesive. We think that we've got the broadest uh, ideological range of any caucus in the building. And yeah, uh, Paul Harris was a leader uh, in uh, uh, trying to reduce the number of exemptions to vaccinations. But uh, does that mean that uh, we had a, you know, a, a, a huge bloody fight in our caucus? No, we respect differences. Uh, and uh, I think the vast majority of our caucus believed in preserving those rights of parents to decide whether or not their children are going to be vaccinated. Uh, but that's what good caucuses do. They accommodate differences uh, and they respect the fact that you can be very passionate and committed uh, on almost any issue, but then you're going to agree on 80 or 90 or 95 percent of everything else and you're going to be a team whenever you can. So if you could sort of put us in the perspective of, as a legislator, uh, the very last day of the regular scheduled session, what's left to do and what do you not know about the budget at this point? Well, we know very little about the budget. Um, and uh, what do we have left to do? Well, I've got a leadership meeting a little later and, and we will be going over the bills that may be necessary. But people probably don't understand just how immense the difference is between a majority and a minority caucus. The majority caucus sets the agenda. So the two majority caucuses, the House Democrats and the Senate Democrats, they're going to decide what happens to all of Washington. They're going to decide what bills are going to run today. Uh, they, they're going to quarrel about some of those. But that discussion is going to be totally under wraps. And uh, the rest of us don't really have a lot of input in this. That's one of the flaws in the system, I think. Uh, the budget uh, was finally unveiled, I think, in some detail uh, yesterday mid-morning or so, and uh, it's 900 pages. So do the House and Senate Republicans and the people of Washington and the folks that are going to pay the taxes have much time to have input on this? Heck no. That's a, an institutional failure, and I hope that we do better at that in the future. With the start of school uh, for the last school year, there were widespread teacher strikes in Washington state uh, related to disputes over uh, how much additional funding there was and how much funding would, would should go towards um, educator raises. Uh, a lot of school districts are asking the state to raise the local taxing authority so that they can invest more in their schools. Um, but I know that's a contentious proposal with the McCleary lawsuit. What's your perspective on yeah, that? Yeah, well, I'm glad that you, that you gave some uh, historical perspective on that. Uh, for a number of years, House uh, and uh, Senate, Republicans and Democrats all worked together to craft this McCleary solution. And uh, we had really strong bipartisan uh, agreements uh, up until two years ago on how we were going to do this. And then we had a, a good year for revenues. Uh, we had uh, Democratic control in both the House and the Senate, and uh, I think a, a major mistake was made when there was about a billion dollars of additional uh, resources uh, put into the educational system, but it was only going to be there for one year. Uh, that was not bipartisan. That was a partisan decision on the part of uh, House and Senate Democrats. Believe it or not, administrators asked us don't give us this money for one year because we know that uh, it's going to be impossible to hold on to those dollars. It's not going to be a reserve. They're going to be negotiated away and create a bow wave that we don't have the resources to fund in the future. And they were exactly right. Uh, dollars that existed for one year were negotiated away uh, in a way that creates a unsustainable bow wave for most of the school districts in the state of Washington. This is a slow moving disaster and it was caused uh, by the legislature uh, operating in a partisan way after years of being bipartisan in this. And so this um, decision that the Democrats have made uh, and I think that they're going to get it done to take away one of the pillars of the bipartisan approach, which was we are going to bring more dollars in to the state and send those out to the school districts. And in return, we're going to reduce the amount of local levy demand on taxpayers that is being shredded right now. And yes, 
House Republicans and Senate Republicans object to this whole, uh, you know, kind of one and one and a half year process that I think really violated the spirit of what we tried to do uh, with McCleary and is creating immense hardships for uh, school administrators, schools, parents and the children that we have a responsibility to look out for. Uh, the state superintendent of public instruction at one point has said that really there there wasn't a specific requirement in the McCleary lawsuit not to uh, allow, to allow local school districts to to raise local tax revenue for their their districts. Uh, it was just he he contended that the main argument was that the state wasn't putting enough money in. So uh, well, with just about five minutes left, is that a fair characterization? I mean, are they? There are two different perspectives on this. One, the levy lid itself is connected to the constitutionality of funding in the state. The other one was that it was just uh, the state wasn't putting enough in. Yeah, well, um, I think that that is sort of answering a little bit of a different uh, question. And, and uh, uh, Chris Reichdahl is, is a friend, and I think there's a lot of things that he's done very well uh, in uh, his job as uh, uh, state superintendent of public instruction. However, part of the problem over the last year is we dumped a billion dollars in. Uh, there was slow and in inadequate guidance uh, from uh, his office in terms of letting schools understand how much money they had, how long it was going to be there, and that has contributed to the problem. And uh, I agree that the decision did not specifically say uh, you can't, uh, you know, go back to higher local levies, but we know because we've had about a 60-year history of this that whenever you have these immense differences in the amount of dollars that can be raised locally between uh, the poorest communities in my district, for example, um, you know, the little town of Rainier, uh, the uh, Esqualia Indian community, uh, the small towns of Yelm and Eatonville, uh, there is so much less... Um, property value that they will never ever be able to come up with as many dollars as you can get in the wealthiest parts of the state like the east side of King County and the Seattle area and that is inevitable it's just math it is going to influence uh, uh, the system in a way that means that if you're fortunate enough to live in a really good zip code a really wealthy area whether you're wealthy or not your kids are going to have a great deal more opportunity than the kids that live in the little towns that I and many other people represent. And that's going to get us back into court. Well, I'm sure we could, there's a lot more stuff we could discuss, but we're coming to the end of our time. So thank you very much, uh, Representative Wilcox. We appreciate it. And thanks for staying up with us. Yeah, thank you very much. It's good seeing you. You too. And we'll be back after a break.